Ephesus is the home of the great temple of Artemis. That's kind of what we thought it looked like. It's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And when Paul went to Athens, he found intellectuals. And when Paul went to Corinth, well, he found hedonists. And when Paul went to Ephesus, he found priests and magicians and witches and warlocks and quacks and charlatans of every description. The worship of Artemis was probably the largest pagan occult in the days of Paul. Ephesus was without a doubt the home of the occult in the first century. Today we're going to look at how just a handful of believers changed the city. And how they did it is incredibly simple. They just simply taught the truth and they lived the truth. And it's going to be important because not only are we going to talk about Paul at Ephesus 2,000 years ago, everything that happened to Paul then is incredibly relevant today. So I have four things to share with you. A lot of scripture today because you know what? God tells a story so much better and so much faster than I can do it. But four truths. Here's number one. When you teach the truth, there will always be opposition from other religious people. Paul writes this, or Luke writes this. Paul entered a synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe in publicly blind the way. So Paul left him. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Now it is amazing how much trouble Satan can stir up among religious people. At first these Jews listened to what Paul said, but the Bible says they became obstinate. I've discovered that religion is one of those things that people really, really want to feel passionate about, but they really, really don't want to think about it all that much. And I think that's what's happened there at that Jewish synagogue. They were just so entrenched into their beliefs, their traditions, that they really just couldn't free themselves to follow Jesus. So when these Jews reject the truth, Paul rents a lecture hall and daily starts teaching. And as people hear what Paul has to say, more and more accept Jesus as Savior, and it gets to the point to where the entire county is hearing about Jesus from Paul. Now, notice please what Paul is not doing. He is not holding a mass revival meeting. He's not starting a Holy Spirit miracle crusade. His primary method against the spiritual strongholds of Ephesus was simply teaching the truth, and living it out in front of these people. Now, there are some miracles happening, in the, and to read the text, it, it looked like it actually surprises Paul and Luke a little bit. Because when Paul is hard at work making tents, people start carrying handkerchiefs and aprons away and using them to cure illnesses and drive out demons. Now, <laughs> time out. Before you say, yeah, I saw somebody on TV do this, I have to explain this a little bit, okay? We are not talking about little pieces of cloth that you blow your nose into. We are not talking about these dainty little aprons ladies some of you guys wear in the kitchen. We're talking work cloth. We're talking rags. We're talking about something you'd pick up and wipe the sweat off your brow and, and your underarms. We're talking simple aprons to keep the stuff off of you. And while Paul is working hard, working up a sweat, the superstitious people of Ephesus are stealing his rags. 
But the real miracle is not that they're stilling them, it's that God is still working through them in some sense for His good. So I really need to make this point as we go through this one. Paul did not put a sign up in front of his tent-making shop saying, for a gift of $20, I'll send you a prayer cloth and an 8 by 10 picture of me wiping the sweat off my forehead. Okay? That may be the way they do it today, but it wasn't the way it happened in the first century. Paul was just simply teaching the truth. Number one. If you teach the truth, you're not going to make everybody happy, then you will stir up some opposition. Point two of four is that when you teach the truth, there will always be attempts to counterfeit the truth. Scripture continues, Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches... I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirits jumped on them and outpowered them, and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Now these seven sons of Sceva, they know a good deal when they see it. They're they're born into a fairly religious, famous family. And they see a chance of making a little money dabbling with the occult here in Ephesus. And so they see all the good luck Paul is having talking about the name of Jesus. And they start trying to kick out evil spirits. Unfortunately, they run into a real one. And the evil spirit says, it's just absolutely hilarious. Jesus, I know. Paul, I know, but I don't really know you, so I'm just going to whoop up on you. And the man just beats on them till they <laughs> must pull the clothes off. They're naked and bleeding, and they run away. I got to tell you, that story spread all over Ephesus. Because in a really, really horrible way, It is incredibly funny. (laughs) One day I'll have to repent of that, but I mean, it is funny. Somebody come up to you and say, hey, did you hear the one about the seven sons of Sceva? Well, I don't know what the answer is, but I know it was the joke in that city. But what I want you to see is this. A small group of Christians have put together a little something in Ephesus And the name of Jesus is being taught and preached by legitimate methods. The the name of Jesus is being spread because people are stealing Paul's sweat rags. The name of Jesus is even being spread by an evil spirit who is too dumb to realize that he's doing God a favor by beating these guys up. And we talked about it earlier. There is power in the name of the Lord, the Scripture says. And in Ephesus, that power was directly against all the power of evil. And it's winning. And it's a shame that today we discount how powerful the name of Jesus still is. Well, there'll be you know, attempts to counterfeit the truth. Number three, when you teach the truth, there's always going to be genuine revival. I love this part of it. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. And the name of the Lord was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely grew even more in power. Hey, you know, people are getting saved in this town. People who dabbled in the black arts not only stopped doing it, but they started bringing their magic cards and their crystal balls and Ouija boards and their books of sorcery 
and they burnt it all in one big place. They did exactly what they needed to be doing. Oh, and by the way, just for what it's worth, they tell us that 50,000 drachmas is the equivalent of 137 years of income. So we're not talking 20, 30 people in this place. We're talking probably in the tens of thousands of people. Genuine revival results from genuine repentance. Genuine revival involves saying yes to Jesus, but it also involves saying no to a lot of other things. A long, very long time ago when I was a McDonald's manager, one of the girls decided to stop smoking marijuana. She was so convicted that she brought the bag to me at work to show me her repentance. I was feeling really good for her, and I was kind of feeling really good for myself because I had talked to her for a while. And then I realized I was in the middle of a McDonald's waving a bag of marijuana around, which probably wasn't the smartest thing to be doing at that time. Well, anyway, her and I had a, uh, a baptismal party for the marijuana in the, in the restroom. We flushed it. But with that in mind, let me get personal just for a second. Is there a bottle of pills in your place? Is there a book or a magazine or a CD or a DVD that really needs to be cleaned out? Is there a cable channel that should have been disconnected a couple years ago? Well, take a lesson from these new Christians at Ephesus. Get it out of your life. Don't sell it in the yard sale to somebody else. Trash it. Burn it or flush it. These people in Ephesus said, I want to be a Christian. I want to be part of this way. I love that name for the early church. We don't choose it much today because there's a cult, believe it or not, in Ohio that way. Not that far that is called the way. But it's a beautiful name for the early church. And these early Christians proved they wanted to be Christians by how they lived. Okay, here's the final point. It's going to be a little bit longer. When you teach the truth, there will always be opposition from the secular world. We are learning that now big time. Scripture goes, about their time there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen, he called them together along with the workmen in related trades and says, Men, you know we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large number of people here in Ephesus <coughs> and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but that the temple of the great goddess, goddess Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. You know, there's one place I found where people don't want the kingdom of God to come. That's their pocketbooks. Money. And with all these people becoming Christians in this city of Ephesus, the silversmiths are getting worried. You see, they made these little tiny silver statues of Artemis, and they sold it to the people when the people came to worship Artemis. But now there wasn't as many people coming, and so they weren't selling as many of these little souvenirs. And so Demetrius brings the craftsmen together and he says, Guys, Hey, we're losing money. Now, understand you really can't say that in real life. That might be the truth, but you can't say that. So Demetrius tries to make it noble. Paul is leading the people astray. He's saying that the gods made by hands are not gods at all. People are going to start disrespecting our trade. People, even worse, will start disrespecting the great goddess Artemis, 
and she's going to be robbed of all her glory. Now, does anybody believe he really believed all that? Not me. I don't believe it even today when people say it. The man was just worried about his money. I have noticed that people who want to start riots in Ephesus or Portland know exactly what emotional issues will set people off. And they try to make the issues <coughs> noble and grand. But most of the time it's about money or some other underlying reason. You know, the real irony here is that Demetrius is absolutely right. But you need to see the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey says. <coughs> when they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and rushed as one man into the theater. Now, by the way, the theater holds 25,000 people. It's still there if you want to go to Ephesus and look at it. I have a suspicion that it's pretty close to being full on that day. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews pushed Alexander to the front, and some of the crowd shouted instruction to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense. But when they realized he was a Jew, they shouted all in unison for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Wow, sounds familiar. Things really haven't changed a whole lot in human nature in 2,000 years. That's kind of the way it still works. Some people are furious. Some people are shouting something totally different. Others, something completely different. Most of them have no clue why they're there. Now, you have to admire Paul's courage. He's willing to go and speak. But fortunately, he has friends that talk him out of it. Fortunately. The city clerk shows up in the nick of time. Now, by the way, that name is deceptive. City clerk is about that far away from mayor, which again has interesting parallels to today's situations now, doesn't it? Fortunately, the mayor shows up. Well, this is what he says. Men of Ephesus... Doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from the heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to be quiet and not do anything stupid or rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples or blasphemed our goddess, and if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and we have proconsuls. They can press charges. If there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we're in danger of being charged with rioting because of today's events. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there's no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. When the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging him, said goodbye, set out for Macedonia. This guy is a great speaker. This guy is a great politician. You can't argue with what he said to the crowd. It's something that should be said to many crowds. Number one, he says, come on, people. Everybody knows how great Artemis is. we got the biggest temple in all the world. You, she can take care of herself, guys. You know, she's a great goddess, goddess Artemis. Indirectly, he's saying, so stop acting stupid. Stop doing things that make you look stupid or wrong. 
And he goes a step forward. He says, you know, these guys you brought in here, they have not blasphemed our goddess. They've not robbed any temples. If Demetrius has got a beef, well, we have courts. We have police. We have lawyers. We have pro councils of that day. And then he has the big point. And by the way, people, you know we live under Roman occupation. And they don't take very kind to riots. And so you might come close to losing your city, if not your life. So maybe you ought to just go home. And on that day, a potentially divisive, disastrous situation was diffused. But more importantly, I want you to see something about this whole message. Paul attacked the strongholds of evil with the greatest weapons of good, and those are the weapons of truth. He did not attack the Jews for their slander of Christianity. He didn't start a hate campaign against the Jews and boycott their products or put a sign in their windows. As far as I know, he didn't even make fun of the crowds who stole his sweat rags and used it. God used it in mighty ways. I don't know whether he laughed at the seven sons of Sceva like I did, but he certainly didn't go after them and say, let's lock them up, let's put them in jail. He didn't spend five hours a day teaching what was wrong with Ephesus. He didn't spend five hours a day teaching people what's wrong with culture, what's wrong with our society, and what's wrong with paganism in general. He did not blaspheme the great goddess Artemis. He didn't draw nasty pictures of Artemis on the wall all over the city. He didn't schedule a protest at the temple. He didn't stand there and pass out tracts as people walked in. What did he do? He simply taught the truth about Jesus. And when people discovered the power of Jesus... And the power that can be brought to their lives, they had no desire to go back to the old dark ways. Now, i got to tell you this, Demetrius was right. Uh, because his business of making idols eventually went out of business. Even the worship of Artemis started to fade away, and the crowd stopped coming to the temple. In fact, 200 years after this, when the city is invaded by another army, they absolutely destroy it. There's only one column left of the huge thing. But the people said, nah, we don't need to rebuild it. We don't need it. Because what had happened in those 2,000 years, the kingdom of God, the church, had taken its place in Ephesus. There are a lot of truths we can bring out of this, but I just want to end with this one here. There are behaviors in this world that are not appropriate in the kingdom of God. And yes, how the world fights, how it cheats, cheats how it lies, how it manipulates, that stuff works out there in the world in a very bad way. But they are not welcome in the kingdom of God. They're not welcome in the church. Because I hope you understand the church is about redeeming people. All people. And more than ever these days, the church is about teaching the truth and living the truth in the presence of all those around us who would distort and not live the truth. It's a big job, but it can be done, and it is our role. And I hope it will become your goal and mission as well. Stand as we share a beautiful...